Foresight, an Alpha Point series. Tricia Zorn Hudson, the most decorated Olympic Paralympic athlete of all time. Supported by Google and $39 glasses. Welcome to Foresight, an Alpha Point series of conversations with changemakers in the blindness community. I'm Scott Thornhill, and our guest is Tricia Zorn Hudson. Tricia, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Foresight. Thank you for having me. We look forward to the conversation. And uh, so you are the most decorated Olympic or Paralympic athlete of all time with 55 total medals, uh, 41 golds, nine silvers, and five bronze. So I would just ask, first of all, when you hear that, what do you think? Uh, it seems kind of unbelievable, but, you know, in hindsight, um, it, you know, over seven uh, Paralympic Games and um, all the, uh, you know, hours I put into training and, you know, traveling for um, the event to different events and uh, it just uh, makes sense and um, uh, didn't have that target or goal you know, to become the most decorated Paralympic athlete. Um, it just happened, um, you know, and I was uh, at a good place at a good time. So you started when you were around eight? Yes. So about eight years yes. old. And so you knew at that time that you had an eye condition, right? Yes. And so tell us a little bit about about that eye condition and sort of how it affected you during during those years. Yeah, so um, I was born with a, a rare eye condition called aniridia, which is the lack of the iris or the color part of the eye. Um, my parents knew at a very young age after my birth um, because I wasn't able to focus on, you know, toys on the ground or in my bed. Or So when I was diagnosed, it was around maybe six months to a year. So, um, and of course, back then with, you know, the lack of technology and, um, you know, the knowledge of what exactly aniridia was, um, it was, my parents were both told that I would probably end up in a institution and have to be dependent on people. Wow. Did you sense in any way that, that you were treated differently or that did you fall behind at all? Or how did you, how'd you do with school? Yeah, I didn't fall behind, but I don't believe that I had the best chance of, you know, a, you know, the best education or best experience, I could say, um, when I went to school, um, you know, I always sat in the front row or, you know, it depended on the teacher, um, you know, and the lack of knowledge. And therefore, right. you know, some teachers didn't want to give me accessibility. Some pe teachers didn't want to give me, you know, um, to allow me to sit in the front uh, row in order to possibly see the, the board um, because everything was, the, to them, it was was, you know, we go by alphabetic order. So being Zorn, I was at the back of the, you know, the classroom. So um, getting large print books, the district was probably one of, you know, the, you know, the least effective um, within the Orange County district where I was in school. And so unfortunately, um, I did a lot of my, you know, early learning through auditory and yeah. um <laughs> Frustration, yes. Um, but, um, you know, as I went through and I think they knew who I was and because of my mom, you know, constantly going yeah. to the school board and everything, um, they the the teachers knew and talked. And then as I got into high school, it got a little better because I was able to get some adaptations yeah. and some of the teachers did understand it. So let's get uh, back to where the beginning, I'll mm -hmm. say. So you started swimming at a very young age. Um, tell us about the beginning of your swimming. Well, um, I was born and raised in Southern California. So I spent many summers at the beach and always, you know, from a time I was able to walk, um, getting into the water and loved it, loved the feeling of it. Uh, so uh, there was a time where uh, in the town we lived in uh, that they were op having a swim team, creating a swim team. And so we asked, my sister and I asked my mom to take us down there. And we did. And um, at that time, we uh, loved it. You know, we didn't know any of the 
for competitive sports uh, or strokes at that time. But mm -hmm. um, it was a small team and getting off the ground and learned the competitive strokes. And um, a couple of years later, um, I was um, being asked to come and transfer to another team, uh, the Mission View Natadors, in order for them to be able to um, create a relay for an, uh, nine and 10 year olds. So despite the eye condition, Right, you were recruited for a relay team, and this was not with other, uh, let's say, disabled individuals or visually impaired individuals. Right, you were competing with fully sighted swimmers. Yes, um, I had no idea um, about the Paralympics. I mean, the Paralympics weren't on, even on my radar at that time. I had no idea that even existed, um, as well as my parents. So um, I was just competing alongside, you know, I don't like the word able body, but people without a physical disability. So I was competing against people who had, you know, normal sight. At 16, you were incredibly close to making the Olympic team. You were within hundreds of a second of making the U.S. Olympic team. I will ask you first, how did that, were you extremely disappointed? Did you expect to be that close? What, were, what was your thought process going into that? Yeah, I mean, I think at the time when I when I went to trials, you know, yeah, you always have that in the back of your mind. Oh, I, I'd like to make it, but um, we knew too at that time that the games were gonna the eighty yeah. game. We were already going to boycott the games, so um, you know, you're going, you're swimming at a meet to say that you made a team, but you don't really are. You're not competing. Right. So, um, I. I I mean, you always want to, as competitive as I am, sure, I wanted to make the team. Yeah. And I missed it by one one hundredth of a second. Um, but I was disappointed as a 16-year-old. But the more I grew and I knew that that moment in time was a pivotal time yeah. because it, it was a door that closed but a door that opened right. because I learned at that time that, there, that the Paralympics existed. And I was contacted by somebody and um, one thing led to another. And then I found myself competing at my first Paralympic Games. And so you're able to go at the age of 16 to the Netherlands, yes. right, to compete in your first Paralympic Games. So what is that like? 16 years oh. old and you're, who, who went with you? Sort of what was that experience like? <laughs> Tell us about it. Well, n none of my family went with me. Um, yeah. So I was on my first international trip. Wow. Um, you know, I had, you know, been domestically, but not internationally. Um, you know, and my mom at the time, she, you know, when I was approached by the Paralympic Games, you know, she didn't want me to go and she didn't want me to use it as a crutch to say, you know, oh, I did this and this because of there are people with physical disabilities, you know. Um, but I, again, as I grew and I wanted to become my own advocate, I wanted to know. I never really been around people with disabilities. So I'm like, mm, that sounds interesting. I'm curious. It piqued my curiosity. So I asked, I told my mom, <laughs> I told her, I was like, I am going to go. I want to see what this is all about. So, Tricia, that's fascinating. So you continue to train with the Olympic team, right, past the, your first Paralympics in 1980. And that really started a, a streak for you in those 1980 Paralympic Games in the Netherlands. Um, seven gold medals. You won every race you competed in. How did you feel coming out of those 80 games? Um, I felt good. I mean, I felt like, I mean, with my times, I felt like that they were, you know, they were adequate and that they were... Um, what I thought they would be based on like with my training and how I was tapering and, you know, the time of the Paralympics. So I was happy with it. But again, I had no expectations. I had no, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. So then 1988, I, I don't want to call it the, the bellwether of yeah. your, but, <laughs> but 1988, 12 gold medals. Yes. So when you look back on your career, and we will talk more about that as well, mm -hmm. how you look back on things. How does 88 stand out for you if it does? Um, well, all the games stand out to me yeah. um, for different reasons. Um, they all have a different memory. They all have different impacts of my career and uh, swimming career. Um, for Seoul, um, it was the first time that we were able to compete um, 
the Paralympic Games in the same venues um, uh, in the as the Olympic athletes. Yeah. So uh, that was huge. These different cities that you've been to, right? You you went, you know, the yes. Netherlands. You didn't have family with you. Yes. You, you go to you go into Korea. What was it like experiencing these cities as someone? anyone, right? And not yeah. just visually impaired, but you're there and you're trying to soak in the, maybe some of the culture and enjoy it. Were you able to do that? Oh, yeah. Other- I mean, it was just, it was very fascinating to meet people from all over the, you know, the globe and to, um, you know, not not just specifically talk about sports, but talk about, you know, just life and, you know, what they experience as a person with a disability in, in their country compared to what we do. And yeah. and so it was just very, um, you know, and of course, the whole, you know, everybody liked to swap uniforms and <laughs> stuff like that and pins. So, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, there is it there. That factor was very um, nice. So you get so let's we'll we'll move four years down the road. You get to 1992, mm-hmm. and you had some things happen in terms of the combining of categories yep. for disabilities. Yeah. So every sport has a a, mad, a number that they have for athletes per sport uh, and per event in order for the event to move forward or to continue on. So in the Paralympics, there, you know, there's a total of 13 categories. Um, the there's they start with the letter S I don't, for mm-hmm. like for swimming is right. S. So S1 through S10 are those people who are physically disabled with it could be, uh, you know, an amputation. It could be uh, cerebral palsy. It could be uh, a, a paraplegic. It could be many different mm-hmm. disabilities depending on what their mobility is. So the lower the number, the more um limited they are the higher the number then it's less limited okay. when with the blind or visually impaired you have three categories um s1 being those athletes who can't are totally blind or just have light perception um s2 are those people who have uh, athletes who are um light perception to uh 20 over 600 i believe visual acuity and then S13, which is our highest category for um, the blind or visually impaired, it's those who have just the, under the U.S. criteria, 2200 vision or law, acuity or less. Okay. Um, One statistic that is just blows my mind is that you had 25 straight gold medals starting in 1980, right, and up to the 92 games. How do you even... Explain that or put that into words in terms of, you know, the competition, the effort that it took and just just what that means to you. Yeah. You know, it, sometimes you I think about it, you know, I don't think about it a lot, but when when somebody brings it up like you and other interviews or uh, people bring it up and, you know, make that yeah. statement, sometimes it makes me uncomfortable <laughs> um, just because um, medals are great. Yeah. Um, but medals, uh, I think I've said and told you that medals don't define me and yeah. who I am. Yeah. Um, and you know, people who, um, people who win awards and medals, um, it's just a example of their hard work and dedication and whatever they were doing at the time. Um, and records are meant to be broken. So, um, I mean, I don't know how, you know, and if that streak would ever be broken. And I mean, I'm sure that, you know, obviously, you know, I pushed myself as far as I could um, in order to make that bar high um, to challenge those people who are coming up and those athletes coming up. So you had not lost a race. I'm going to, I hate to use the word lost, it's I just okay. it just sounds so bad. It's okay, but but you had you you had not um, uh, lost a race yes. from 1980 through 1992, mm-hmm. right? And then in the combining of the races, you got a silver mm-hmm. in '92, yes. but it was in this combined race where you're now competing against people who have significantly more vision than you do. Yes, right. Yes, and actually, I, yeah, I was upset about it. Um, you know, just because I didn't feel, you know, 
fair to one person is and you know it means yeah. differently sure. but i felt that it was unfair but then again um i it the impact was a little less because it was a person who who did get the gold was from the US. So yeah. that even, yeah. you know, that kind of helped with it, but it was still um it was still an impact yeah. to me. And so in nineteen ninety two, if I have my math right, uh you're about twenty eight years old. Yes. Um in those games. Were you at all starting to to feel like, okay, I'm not the I, I'm <laughs> I'm not the new uh the, the new one on the block here? How did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I felt like the grandma. I mean, I'll admit it. I mean, I was, I was, I mean, I think my, the next per, youngest person was like 21, I think, or something. I don't wow. I can't remember. But um, yeah, I mean, and especially for our team, yeah. there wasn't too many people that were, you know, that were, like I said, at that sure. age, because swimming wasn't, is not, like you said, Swimming, um, you don't, you didn't have a long career at that yeah. time. Um, usually, you know, you peak when you're 15, 16. I mean, even when going into college, it was something unheard of. Yeah. So if you felt like grandma in 1992, in 1996 in Atlanta. Yes, I really <laughs> you felt were great that. grandma. I was at that great point, grandma right? at okay, that okay. time. So what was it like, again, you know, being in your own, being in your own country and, and not just being in your own country because you you would th that experience occurred. but you're in your own country and you're competing in the same venues as the Olympic athletes, right? Yes. So what was that combination like? Now you're in the same venues, you're in Atlanta. Was it a different experience than the others? You know, I think anytime you're able to compete on your own soil, um, country soil, I think it's it's special in itself. Um, that those games, were you know had other you know had other things to it um too um it was the first time that um my dad was able to go mm -hmm. and watch me compete um so um or that he wanted to i guess come and watch me compete um so uh, that was really um special um being able to have the home crowd was special um and again another thing was that was the first time that they really had um a huge well outside soul was big for crowds in the yeah. stands but for people the way they did tickets um the stands were just packed wow that's great. That had to be special. Oh, with yeah. Your dad there, oh, and the yes. crowds, and the whole thing. Yeah. Um. And and so we'll move on to the to the other two Paralympics. Yeah. There's still two more to go. I won't even get into what generations <laughs> you felt like you were yeah, at that right. point. But uh, <laughs> but but there were a lot of other changes happening during this time, right? Yes. So the uniforms are starting yes. to change. You're starting to see some maybe some sponsorship things that weren't happening prior to that for Paralympic athletes. Talk to us a little bit about that, like how you were seeing a little more parity between the Olympics and the Paralympics. Yeah. So before, after 96, um, you know, there was a lot of conversation about um, sponsorships um, and about training and having the ideal training situation. Um, before 2000, um, Paralympic athletes were not able to be full time status as resident athletes uh, at the Olympic uh, training centers. Uh, and so um, there were myself and two other, basically myself and another athlete who uh, went to the Olympic Committee um, and we requested that we um, be a pilot program as a resident athlete. And it took quite the um, emotional impact in order for them to, you know, say, yes, we'll do it. Um, and from that point forward, it's just steamrolled into now it's, you know, it, there is no, you know, even discussion about, oh, you can't, you won't. Um, I mean, Paralympic athletes are resident athletes. They get the same services. They yeah. get, you know, they can have access to all the, um, you know, the physiotherapy and everything and venues at the training centers that we didn't have when we were when we were competing yeah. um and even when we were 
part of the quote resident pilot program for Paralympics before um, 2000, before the Paralympics, uh, we were able to teach them basically of, you know, we're not asking for anything different, (laughs) you know, I mean, to have a pool right there for me specifically to have a pool right there at the same place where I'm training at. And I didn't have to worry about transportation. I didn't have to worry about asking somebody else to take me to the pool. I didn't have to worry, you know, to go to a grocery store, you know, everything, all my meals and everything were right there. So it was just the little things, but they didn't have to change anything. Whereas they thought it first they had to did you get any pushback on on that i mean oh. after the fact i mean did that after the fact like they thought you know paralympic athletes are not on the same level as the oh, olympic yeah. athletes i mean <laughs> yes I, I recall it the our first our first swim workout they had the pool now it, it at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, there's uh, the pool is 50 meters, um, which is the Olympic size. But then also you can tr- convert it into a 25 yard um, going the other way. Um, and I remembered our first workout and they had it at 25 yards. And we're like, why? Like, why are you why are you doing this? And they're like, oh, and they had like three lifeguards. And they're like, well, we didn't know if you can swim 50 meters. And we're like, oh, my Lord, you know, how in the world? What did you think? And so we had them literally change everything. And but again, it's just the lack of knowledge yeah. of, you know, just people not understanding. Yeah. Um, they thought that they had to change the laundry facility or they thought that going through the food line in the cafeteria that we would, you know, be touching all the food. And it, it just it was just sometimes that you just have to laugh about you it. Do. But um, it was just like it's just the lack of knowledge and understanding of not asking questions and the fact that we went forward and we asked and we put the ask out there to let us do this to show what we are able to do and you don't have to do um has turned that program totally around that's incredible and so here you are in 2004 you have said that the medal you won at the 2004 games yes. um, was the most meaningful to you and you've yes. mentioned your mother multiple times yes um and so tell us about that I know she had passed just prior yes. so yes she had passed away in um, June of 2004 from cancer um it was very quick um and so I was at that phase of, you know, I had taken some time off, obviously priority and didn't know if I wanted to compete, didn't want, didn't know if I really wanted to go, um, to the Paralympic games. Um, but after, you know, talking to the rest of my family, um, and talking to my support group, um, I decided that my that's what my mom would would want me to do would to be to compete um so that's why i went forward and i i continued on going to those games yeah so you've you've talked about how the the medal that you won in 2004 and how meaningful that was to you yeah so going into that race it was my last race and you know i had competed in a couple others and obviously i didn't medal but um and just for many different things. And I knew that my only shot to win a medal was in the hunter back. And that was my, you know, my best, yeah. best event anyway. So um, going into it, I just, you know, I, I just said, well, it is what it is. And, you know, it's, I, I've done everything I could do. I prepared, um, you know, physically and mentally the best I could do. And, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, And that's kind of how any sport is. I mean, some days, you know, you're going to do really well and some days you're not going to do so well. So um, going into that race, I was, you know, it was awkward at the at first because especially those games because of course my my mom wasn't there but you know with the support of of my team and everything so when i when we when i went to the event and i finished 
I, of course, couldn't see the scoreboard, so I couldn't know. So somebody, a couple of my teammates came around and they, you know, told me that I had gotten the bronze. And so, you know, I was really excited because I was, that was my last shot to get a medal. And I'm like, I got to get a medal at least for, you know, for this (laughs) game, gosh, you know, so that's just the competition part, competitiveness in me. So, um, so I was really happy and I knew my, you know, my mom would be very happy and, um, it just had a special moment that to me, it just tells you that, um, you know, gold medals are great, but they're not everything. And that it, it medals have a, uh, per- they have a personal sure. a memory t- um, affixed to them. Right. And for me, that was one of them. Um, the other funny thing was, was I knew it was, that was my last race. That was my last thing. I knew I didn't have to go into that environment yeah. anymore. Um, I knew I was moving forward and starting a career, uh, my second professional yeah. career. So that, that, wow, that is, I'm sure that was just emotional and you were just relieved and yes. all the things that you've just mentioned ab- about that race. But at the end of that games of the 2004 games, mm-hmm. You were honored with being the flag bearer for the United States of America. Yes. At the closing ceremonies, just to say that, right? Mm-hmm. The flag bearer for the United States of America for the closing ceremonies. What, again, what did that mean to you? That meant that your fellow athletes, uh, in my understanding, mm-hmm. thought enough of you, like you're the one we want to do this. I wasn't even thinking about that. I didn't even know I was being yeah. even, you know, put my name in as, as somebody who who would be considered for that. So um, when I was told, you know, it was very emotional. I again, like you said, it's 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 represents your your at your former athletes with you who who've competed with me. Um, for years, you know, who might have been within, you know, the Paralympic Games um, from all sports, too. It's not just swimming. It was yeah. from all Paralympic sports who vote. So for them to see me as them rep- me representing them during that time um, was a very special moment. So as we look at the post sort of um, Paralympic career years, mm-hmm. Uh, and and reflecting back on all of your accomplishments, but but then things that 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 happen fairly soon after those two thousand four mm-hmm. games, um, you ended up having um, surgery. Yes. On, all right. Uh, two within about six months uh, on yes. your to 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 get artificial iris yes. uh, implants. So tell us about those decisions to do that, like or the decision to do that. What what led to that? Yeah, you know, it wasn't something that was planned. That's for sure. Um, you know, you've heard me say right time, right place, and I was just one day I was just sitting and working, and I had the TV on, and it was. Uh, it was an advertisement of a doctor and they're like, well, we're doing this FDA study for artificial iris implants. And, um, you know, we're, you know, if you're interested or you think you would qualify, you know, give us a call. And (laughs) I'm like, yeah, do I, do I want to, do I not want to, I probably won't qualify. So, um, I I did, I don't don't know what it was, but that made me say, okay, I'm just going to call. So I called, Um, and it was a, um, it was a doctor in Indianapolis, uh, and he was doing an FDA study. Um, and, um, it was a FDA study for uh, those people who were, had aniridia from, from birth, not from an accident. He had done, um, implants for people who had an accident and lost the aniridia, wow. but this was a study for um, people who had art, um, who had aniridia from birth. Yeah, and so um, we actually, so I called and went in there for a consultation, and he goes, "Oh yes, you you qualify." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> let's go." <laughs> so I yeah, was I nervous? Yeah. I mean, you know, you're always from a medical procedure standpoint, you know, there's always risks and, you know, they can't guarantee it's not 100%. Sure. Um, and so from that point, I was a little nervous, but I I figured, and that's why it was a kind of a joke, because I'm like, okay, I said, you can do my 
my worst eye first and then you can do my better eye depending on how it all works out you know and so um so it was it was a great experience um you know i can say i was able to choose the color of my iris um those you know not too many people can do that sure um so i was able to do that um so it was it was just a great experience and um dr Francis Price is just a fabulous doctor. And how has it affected you? How, how has your vision changed? The one life-changing thing that it's done mm-hmm. is um, I had enough vision um, returned that I can now be a bioptic driver. Um, oh. So um, that was life-changing. Wow. Um, you know, I never thought that at me being a person with aniridia growing up or anything that I would be able to be independent to the point of not having to ask people for rides, transportation and stuff like that. On December 31st of 2004, you got an opportunity that very few people are going to have, which was you got to be on stage in Times Square for the New Year's Eve celebration, New York City, uh, taking us into 2005. What was that like? Oh, it was it was cold. Um, It was cold. (laughs) It was really cold. Um, But it was it was really um, it was really a great experience. I mean, I I'm so grateful that. I was asked, um, you know, New York, I mean, to be in Times Square, you know, you watch it on TV and um, to see the apple drop and and then to be asked to be a part of that process um, was just something that, you know, it was a dream come true. It was like a bucket list thing. So, yeah. um, but it was really, really cool. Um, you know, the some of the other athletes that were there, um, you know, that I'd seen and I've never met, sure. I was able to, you know, finally meet them. Um, and to be a part of, you know, history, um, so to speak, um, that was, that was just something that you can't ever take back. Yeah. Um, you know, and on top of that, you know, being able to close the stock exchange, that was something else that um, during that same trip wow. I was able to do. So that was, you know, an experience that, um, you know, that I'll always remember. In 1988, Sports Illustrated, you were nominated as Woman of the Year by Sports Illustrated. Yes. I, 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 I well, I, mean, I, I wouldn't be nominated, but for that, but, <laughs> but I, I can only imagine what that for you would have been like and for your mom and dad like what what was that I mean yeah I you know when I was first told about it you know it was something you know the the competitiveness came out you know I was like "Eh," you know (laughs) okay we gotta get I gotta get I gotta do it you know and then when you know after you look back on it and stuff just the how the the the, how big that event is and how big a deal it is at the time. I didn't really realize it cause I was too immature and young at the time. But then now, you know, as you get older, yeah. you realize that it was a big deal. And, um, you know, it, it just is another reflection of, you know, finally media and you know the press and they were they took note of you know the accomplishments outside of not just the medals but now like what you know i had other things going on um on top of just getting that it was there was another reasoning behind that to to this day usa swimming gives out an award each year yes uh the Trisha Zorn Award, yes, right to um, to a um, disabled athlete, and yes. so I'm just, uh, what do you think about that? Your name's on an award. I mean, that's that's amazing. I guess the impact that I wanted, you know, from the award is that, you know, people who know who know me and who who knew me back when I was swimming, that it wasn't just about swimming, but it was about the person. And 
um, how the impact that I made on not just the sport, but on the whole Paralympic movement about just humanity in itself. Yeah. In 2012, you were inducted into the International Paralympic Hall of Fame. Yes. And so that in and of itself is just an incredible honor, right? It came after, you you know, eight years after yes. your final Paralympic Games. And then um, I, I won't ask you about that one just by itself, but then just in 2022, mm -hmm. um, you were inducted into the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Hall of Fame, which was a long time coming. Yes. Um, I'd love to hear about the joining of the Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame, yes. uh, and then also you being inducted into both of those entities and sort of how you how you think about that. Yeah, so uh, the when I was first um, inducted into the International Paralympic Hall of Fame in London in 2012, um, it was, you know, I was very honored to be able to be um, associated with that and to, you know, be a um, representative of that group of people. Um, when... And I and it, I think at that time it just showed that, um, you know, internationally, um, people recognized um, my um, what I had done in the sport, not just in the pool, but the advocacy that I had done outside of the pool. Um, and I think that um, you know, internationally that was, that's, they see it differently. Mm -hmm. They see Paralympics differently and athletes differently than we do here in the U S. Um, so the way the process is he within the U S you know, it, you go through a nomination period. It's very political. It's the nomination, you know, you have to be nominated by a national governing body and then it goes through another board and then it goes through another process. And then, you know, p the public is, you know, is brought into it for a certain amount of votes. And, you know, so I, you know, so it's more of a, it seems like here in, in the U.S., at some point, it seems like it's more of a pop, uh, popularity right contest, so to speak, yeah. rather than seeing the athlete or the person who they are. Yeah. And, and you've got the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Hall of Fame. And so yes. um, that that didn't happen that long ago no. uh, that that <laughs> was combined. So yes. and, and, and you've mentioned multiple times about some of the political aspects and sort of how the Paralympics and the Olympics people weren't necessarily treated uh, equally, we'll yes. say. Yes. Um, it seems like that's moving in the right direction. Do you feel that way? Oh, yes. I think that it's moving in the right direction. Do we have ways to go? Yes. Yeah. Um, but there are certain aspects now that, you know, athlete, Paralympic athletes have um, that and opportunities that they have that I didn't have or yeah. other past Paralympic athletes didn't have, um, such as um, sponsorships. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't, we paid for, you know, early on, we paid, we had to pay for our uniforms to right. go, you know, to the games. Um, we had to pay a participation fee, wow. um, so to speak. Um, you know, so we didn't get any of that. Um, but now, you know, Paralympic athletes are getting the same um, uniforms um, or similar uniforms than um, what they, what the Olympic athletes get. Um, when it comes to um, they call it prize money or award money based on y how you do right. medal money. Um, you know, it was only at in um, Sydney was the in 2000 was the first time that Paralympic athletes were awarded, you know, uh, award money. Yeah. Nothing, nothing a lot. I mean, it was like, I think it was like, um, I want to say like four hundred dollars for a gold medal, two hundred for a silver, and a hundred dollars. Whereas you know, Olympic athletes were making twenty five thousand for a gold, wow. fifteen for a silver, you know, or whatever. But now, um, as of Tokyo, they are making Paralympic athletes 
are making the same prize money as Olympic athletes. Wow, that is definitely so, progress. And sponsorships, they are, you know, are more prevalent. You hear of them more, um, such as Toyota is doing, T-Mobile, um, any of your big name, Nike, um, Arena, Speedo. You hear a lot of people getting sponsorships yeah. with Paralympic athletes, whereas at, you know, when I was competing, yeah. We didn't have those opportunities. But in, in looking back over it, you still hold several records. Um, yes. And so in, in looking at that, um, you still hold the world record in the 200 backstroke. Uh, and that is the only world record that is still in place from before 2000. You know, I think that there there are certain athletes that have certain gifts that they'd been given and um you know that you have like i said sometimes you you have a really outstanding um you know swim um and i think that at that time that that swim was um one of my better swims and um and races you have more medals that you have won than than names like Jim Thorpe and Jesse Owens, Jackie Joyner Kersey, Carl Lewis, and you won almost twice as many medals as Michael Phelps, uh, who many would say is, you know, the greatest American swimmer, yes. whatever it is. I, I, I don't even want to ask you sort of how it makes you feel, but that's what the question comes down yeah. to for me. Can you put that in perspective even? Yeah, you know, I think those people, you know, that you just named off, were their icons, their yeah. their people that we inspire to be yeah. um, when we when I mean, some of them, some of them are young, um, but some of them, you know, that you look at them and you look at their career and you you say, oh, I want to be something. I want to yeah. make an impact. I want I would like to be a household name like yeah. them. Um, and, you know, maybe subconsciously, you know, that was me. Um, at a young age, wanting to be yeah. like that. Um, so to know that I accomplished that um, and beyond, uh, you know, from a physical standpoint of a medal count, you know, it's, I guess I just, it makes me feel good that I yeah. I, made, I accomplished the goal I set out to sure. go, um, but uh, to be placed in the same category, even with those yeah. names, it's like something I you can't imagine. Sure. It's something that's untouchable to me. So a couple more things I just wanted to touch on before we wrap up our time mm -hmm. with you. And not only um, were you an advocate during your years uh, in, in the Paralympics and for other athletes, mm -hmm. but it seems as though you wanted to continue being an advocate on a different level. So you yes. went to law school. I did. Right. And yes. so now you're an attorney. So just sort of tell yes. us challenges. How was that going through law school? I mean, even with, you know, vision loss and sort yeah. of dealing with accessibility. What about that? Yeah. I, well, when I decided to go to law school, it was uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, young, uh, when I was younger, I was always thought that law um, was something that was I was curious about, mm -hmm. um, wanted to maybe possibly pursue, um, but with the vision, um, with the vision loss and everything at a young age, you know, I was kind of pushed, you know, and kind of pressured into um, not going that route yeah. and going to into a thing that was less reading, blah, blah, blah. So um, when I was able to have the opportunity, you know, and obviously grew up and able to make my own decisions and um, learned that I really wanted to pursue that. So um, when I went to law school, you know, you would think that you, th this is a law school, that they would understand, you know, accommodations need, uh, you know, to help a student be successful. And unfortunately, that wasn't my experience. Yeah. Um, I didn't have that great of experience just because um, I was the first um, physically uh, disabled and let's put it blind or visually impaired yeah. uh, student um, in the IU school law uh, yeah. in Indianapolis. So 
going through growing pains with them and, um, you know, trying to figure out what was going to, you know, help me uh, be successful without them having to do anything outside of what they thought may yeah. be cheating, you know, or giving an advantage to another student. Sure. Um, it was quite the process. Yeah. So, so after law school and everything, you know, I wanted to, um, I didn't really know how I wanted to practice. Yeah. Um, and then I had the opportunity um, to um, join and get with the VA with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and um, in the fiduciary um, department and where we actually, where I now am able to use my skills of advocacy for veterans and veterans benefits to yeah. make sure yeah. that they're being taken care of and that their or that their funds and benefits are not being misappropriated or misused. Yeah, that's tremendous. So I want to hear more about that. So mm -hmm. so as you look at, you know, you have this award named after you, how do you think about being a role model for young um, athletes, uh, let's say physically um, disabled young athletes uh, um, specifically, mm -hmm. um, uh, female athletes? physically disabled young athletes, even more specifically, like, yep. do you think of yourself as a role model? Do you, do you want to be that? How do you, how do you view that? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's been my biggest um, push um, and reason why I've taken a lot of risks throughout my swimming career and um, is just to, and professional career, um, being a female, um, and being able to break down barriers yeah. and to show society that, you know, just because I'm a female and I have a physical disability, I'm capable of doing anything that I choose to do, yeah. that I'm not going to stop because maybe society has put up a barrier or put up a wall of, or stigma saying, you know, in the past, well, yeah. this hasn't, you know, you haven't been able to do this. Well, I've tried to throughout my, the years in swimming and in my professional career to exceed that and those expectations yeah. in order to let these young girls know that, you know what, if they choose to be, you know, a, a trauma surgeon, or if they choose to be an astronaut, if they choose to be whatever they choose to be, yeah. that they're able to do that as long as they have the opportunity to do it. I do before we, before we part ways and, and, um, finish our time together. Mm -hmm. I do want to ask you, we always have a foresight question uh, for for the series. And the question is that um, if you could change something for people who are blind today, what would you change? Uh, I would change um, the, I would, I would like to change the stigma of what society has on those who have, who are blind or visually impaired, um, to um, be accepting and allow our group yeah. um, to be able to have the opportunities uh, that those people who aren't blind or visually impaired um, are able to have, yeah. um, and uh, have it have those opportunities given freely where whereas not having it's always instead of being always a challenge or always you know something that we have to fight for whereas people see it for what it is yeah that's great thank you for sharing that yeah Patricia, thank you so much for your time today. Your story is amazing. The numbers, I can't even fathom the numbers of, of what you've accomplished. But beyond that, um, who you are as a person um, and what you've done in terms of advocacy and really the changes that have happened. And I think in large part to, to what you've been willing to do uh, as it relates to the Paralympics and beyond. So thank you for your time with us here on Foresight today. Thank you for having me. Foresight, an Alpha Point series. Tricia Zorn Hudson, the most decorated Olympic Paralympic athlete of all time. 
supported by Google and $39 glasses. For more information on supporting the Foresight series and AlphaPoint, visit alphapoint.org slash foresight.